Today's presentation is entitled, Does the Moon Have Any Part in Defining the Beginning of the Biblical Month? And this is part three of three parts. In part three, we are investigating if the great kings, prophets, and leaders followed the laws of Moses or not. It is time to do some research. We will next examine the 20 non-Torah verses associated with these leaders. Did they follow the laws of Moses or not? In 1062 BC, we talk about King Saul with Jonathan and David. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 5, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is a new month. H. 2320. And I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field under the third day at even. 1 Samuel 20 verse 18 Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is a new month. H. 2320 And thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. Then we have 1 Samuel 20 verse 24 So David hid himself in the field, and when the new month, H. 2320, was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. Now, nowhere in Torah does Moses command the new moon to be observed. Nowhere. Ten thirty BC, King David, a man after Yahweh's heart. Both Moses and King David were men of Yahweh. King David followed the laws of Moses. Therefore, he would have honored Yahweh's month according to the creation week, as recorded by Moses. Because Numbers 10.10 10 says to blow the trumpet in the new month, H2320 is the number again, King David would have written Psalm 81, verse 3 like this, Blow up the trumpet in the new month, not the new moon. H2320 is the correct number, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. Nowhere in Torah does Moses command the trumpet to be blown in the new moon. Ten fifteen BC, King Solomon, he was instructed by King David, Solomon is made king by David in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 1. Then these instructions follow. In 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 31. And to offer all burnt sacrifices unto Yahweh in the Sabbath, in the new months, H. 2320, and on the set feasts by number, according to the order commanded unto them continually, before Yahweh. Nowhere in Torah does Moses give instructions for sacrifices on the new moons. 1015 to 1014 BC, King Solomon, he was of wisest men, the Bible says. King David reminds King Solomon of these instructions in 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 3. Keep the charge of Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the Law of Moses. Solomon's kingdom was well organized with chief fathers and captains of thousands and hundreds and their officers that served the king in any matters of these courses, which came in and went out month by month. H. 2320. 
throughout all the months of the year of every course were twenty and four thousand. See first Chronicles twenty seven one to fifteen. Solomon names twelve captains for each year. Nowhere in Torah does Moses make provision for thirteen moon months in a year. Ten fifteen BC King Solomon follows David's words. Below is a third of four witnesses from King Solomon supporting the new month, H twenty three twenty, as given in Hebrew. So let's read Second Chronicles two verse four. Behold I build an house to the name of Yahweh, my Elohim, my God, to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual showbread, and for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbath, and on the new months, H twenty three twenty, and on the solemn feasts of Yahweh our Elohim. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Solomon did not honor any new moon. Hebrew does not use H thirty three ninety four. One thousand four BC King Solomon regards worship statutes. We read in Second Chronicles eight thirteen. Even after a certain rate every day offering according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbath and on the new month, H twenty three twenty, and on the solemn feasts three times in the year, even in the feast of the unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. This event is nine years after first Chronicles twenty three thirty one. Solomon still follows the Torah commands for offerings on the new month, H twenty three twenty. Eight ninety five BC Elisha and the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman knew Elisha was a great prophet according to the testimony in Second Kings four twenty two. And she called unto her husband and said that I may run to Elisha, the man of God. Verse twenty three And he, the husband of the Shunammite woman, said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him, to Elisha today? It is neither the new month, H twenty three twenty, nor Sabbath. The time frame five hundred fifty years after Moses. Hebrew does not use H3394 for moon. Elisha trained under Elijah. Both were great men of Yahweh. Seven eighty seven PC Amos deals with apostate Israel. Now that was six hundred sixty years after Moses. Amos is faced with Israel's apostasy of the pagan new moons. Yahweh tells Amos that Israel will long for the new moons and Sabbaths to be over to follow their pagan ways and immorality. They were led away by false gods. Amos 2.4. One of them honored on the day of the new moon. In Amos 8.5 saying, When will the new moon or the new months, H twenty three twenty be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. Israel is admitting to their apostasy, were they celebrating the H thirty three ninety four number, the new moon? Instead of the H twenty three twenty, the new month. Seven eighty five BC Hosea deals with apostate Israel. Yahweh gives Hosea counsel for Israel about eighty four years before 
Hezekiah's sundial miracle. There's definitely a huge problem with apostasy in Israel. Will Yahweh's people heed Hosea's warning after her new moons? Hosea 2.11 says, I, Yahweh, will also cause all her mirth, her joy, to cease, her feast days, her new moons, age 23.20, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Hosea also was, has a warning about worship celebrations. Again, Hosea 2.11, I, Yahweh, will also cause all her mirth, her joy, to cease, her feast days, her new moons, age 23.20, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. In Hosea 2.11, her new moons have nothing to do with the loss of Moses. Seven sixty BC Isaiah deals with apostate Israel. Only twenty five years after the writings of Hosea, Isaiah gives another warning about the apostasy of Israel before they were taken into captivity by Assyria. However, they kept running after the pagans with regard to their worship, ignoring the covenant commands of Yahweh, including the thirty day month. As you will note on the next uh, slide, verse 14, it says very emphatically, your new moons, age 2320, and your appointed feasts, in comparison to Hosea's wording of her new moons, age 2320, not age 3394, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Isaiah 1, 13-14 should have been translated as your new months. Even though it does not matter if the verse said new moons or new months, the point is neither their, their new moon or months was sacred and did not belong to Yahweh, for it was all reckoned according to paganism and moon worship. Isaiah's record is very worthy of careful study. Isaiah one thirteen states, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, number H2320, and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. This was about 760 B.C. The next verse in Isaiah 1, your new moons, age 23-20 again, and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, I am weary to bear them. Isaiah 1, 14 is quite an incredible verse. It should say new months, which are the new months, according to how the pagans calculated the pagan festivals. Questions. Is it not interesting that the real problem of calculating the pagan months is actually called new moons in Isaiah 114? Did the King James Version translators know it? That it was apostate appointed feasts that were fixed to the new moons? Yahweh's appointed times were never fixed to the new moons. Question, which came first, the new month or the new moon? Creation week, where does the month begin? On the first day or on the fourth day with the moon? The first day of the creation week has to be the first day of the month and the first day of the year. The first day the moon appears is not the first day of Yahweh's month, but the moon does have a set cycle, so the fourth day is the first day of the moon's cycle. If the pagans looked to the moon for their calculations, they were on a different month, not the creation month. 
Yahweh's people were following this pagan style of reckoning the month. Who still holds tenaciously to this teaching today? seven twenty six BC King Hezekiah Reformation Restoration All kings and leaders were responsible to know Torah and teach it, according to Deuteronomy seventeen. King Hezekiah would have observed the thirty day months like this Count one to thirty, then start over. A repetitive occurrence. In 726 BC, Hezekiah invited Israel and Judah to celebrate the Passover in the second month. Priests were not sanctified for the first month. The heathen altars in Jerusalem were destroyed. A second Passover was a grand reformation and restoration. There was a massive campaign against all idol worship. Hezekiah absolutely followed the Torah guidelines for celebration of Sabbath, appointed times and new months. Hezekiah followed Torah guidelines to determine the new month. Second Chronicle thirty one three says he, meaning King Hezekiah, appointed all that the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings, to wit, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbath, and for the new months, age twenty three twenty, and for the set feasts, as it is written in the law of Yahweh. Age twenty three twenty should be translated as new months. Yahweh's king would not have been following the pagan new moon. Seven hundred one BC, King Hezekiah's sundial miracle. No other Bible testimony is recorded three times. This is extremely important to understand. Second Chronicle thirty two twenty four states in those days. Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto Yahweh, and he gave him a sign. Second Kings twenty nine to eleven states Shall the shadow go forth ten degrees, or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward ten degrees. And he brought the shadow ten degrees backwards. Then we have Isaiah thirty eight seven to eight, and this shall be a sign unto thee, behold I will bring again the shadow of the degrees ten degrees backwards. Seven oh one BC Sundial's lunar cycle consequences. The yearly cycle was changed from three hundred sixty days to three hundred sixty five plus days in a year. The length of the moon's lunar cycle from the fourth day of creation was changed from 30 days in a cycle to 28 to 29 and a half days in a cycle. The moon month is now very distinct from Yahweh's month. Did Yahweh's people turn their eyes away from following the new moons? It took the pagan nations 50 to 75 years to adjust the unstable calendar eventually adding five plus days to the end of the 360th day. History between 701 BC to 606 BC and then to 538 BC. In 701 BC about we have the sun dial. So let's go to 606 BC. Judah was exiled about 100 years after Israel was scattered by Assyria for refusing to follow Torah commands despite the teachings of kings and prophets. But pagan Babylon was following the moon month as well. An exile of 70 years affected Judah. 596 BC. Ezekiel was also exiled to Babylon 
as Levite and a priest, while Daniel resided in the court of the king. Ezekiel lived among the exiles from Judah. He was called a prophet, teacher and counselor for Yahweh. Would Judah return to Yahweh's covenant calendar under his leadership? 538 BC, Judah returns under Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem and their land. These three great leaders were commissioned to bring Judah into full alignment with all the statutes and judgments, including the covenant calendar. Were they successful? Five seventy four BC Ezekiel, a Levite, prophet and priest of Torah. Ezekiel had authority to teach the covenant instructions correctly. Ezekiel would have taught the strict laws of the Torah for the observance of the feasts, Sabbath, and the new month requirements. His instructions in the next two passages were for the services to be conducted in the new temple at Jerusalem after the return of the exiles from Babylon. However, this temple was never built. The following passages are well after Hezekiah's sundial miracle and about 38 years before the first exiles returned to Jerusalem. 574 BC, Ezekiel, will his prophecy follow the Torah? Would Ezekiel's prophecy follow the words of the 1611 translation for the Hebrew term of Kodesh, the Hebrew number H2320? Ezekiel 47-4517, And it shall be the prince's part to give offerings in the feasts and in the new moons, H2320, and in the Sabbath. Ezekiel 46 1 thus says Yahweh on the Sabbath it shall be opened and in the day of the new moon age 23 20 it shall be opened Ezekiel 46 3 likewise the people of the land shall worship before Yahweh in the Sabbath and in the new moons again age 23 20 Verse 6, and in the day of the new moon, age 2320. Ezekiel's temple was never built to provide a witness for a new moon day. Notice the King James Version of 1611 translation does not give recognition to Yahweh's new month. 538 to 516 BC, Zerubbabel, the first return of Babylonian exiles. Ezra chapters 1 to 6 records the history of Zerubbabel 60 years before Ezra arrives with the second group of exiles. Ezra tells us how the law of Moses is still first priority almost 1,000 years later. It states in chapter 3 verse 2, Then stood up Yeshua and his brethren the priest and the rubber ball and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. 538 to 516 BC, the rubber ball, the first return of Babylonian exiles. Ezra recorded exactly what the Rebbe did as it is written in the Law of Moses. Is it possible that Ezra would have written verse 5 this way? And afterward offered the continual burnt offering both of the new months, H2320, and of all the set feasts of Yahweh that were consecrated and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto Yahweh. These offerings did not follow the pagan new moon. Again, the King James 1611 translators do not give recognition to Yahweh's H2320 new month. 
458 BC, Ezra, the second return of Babylonian exiles, Ezra led the second group of captives to Jerusalem about 80 years after Zerubbabel. Who was Ezra? He was an Aaronic priest, skilled scribe and teacher of the law or the Torah of Moses. See Ezra 7, 1, 5, 6 and 10 and chapter 8, 1 to 3 and 9. Between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra is called a priest eight times and a skilled scribe seven times. This confirms his well-qualified credential. Yahweh made sure Ezra's credentials were the best for another reformation and restoration in Judah. Again in 458 BC, Ezra, the second return of Babylonian exiles, we know that Ezra was a strong leader. In chapter 7 verse 10, it says, For Ezra, a skilled scribe and ironic priest, had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Torah of Yahweh, and to do it, and to teach Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra taught the statutes and ordinances to Israel along with Nehemiah and the Levites according to Yahweh's everlasting covenant. Esther would never have written anything about new moons, nor taught the people such things. Who earns your trust, Ezra or the 1611 translators? We must recognize that Yahweh was watching over the leaders of his people, especially through his prophets, Amos, Hosea, Hezekiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Ezra and others, such as priests, scribes, kings, and prophets, were instructed and accountable to teach Torah truth. Therefore, their actions and instructions must default back to the teaching the Creator's biblical 30-day months according to number H2320 Kodesh. Or do you think it's more likely the translators, influenced by Jewish tradition, interpreted the number H2320 word incorrectly, using the inaccurate words of new moons rather than new months? Four forty six to four thirty four BC Nehemiah, the third return with exiles. The date of event, about 10 plus years after Esau returned with the second set of exiles. Nehemiah led out in another campaign for reformation and restoration. Under Nehemiah's guidance, the people had confessed and repented for their sins with the pagan nations. Nehemiah 9. On the second return to Jerusalem after 12 years, he found the people had fallen back into their evil ways, even conducting business on the Sabbath. Nehemiah instructed the Levitical priests to implement the observance of the law of Moses. Is there proof? Four forty six to four thirty four BC continuing Nehemiah ten thirty three for the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continued burnt offering of the Sabbath of the new months, here's the word H2320 again, for the set feasts and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. H2320 must be translated as new months. Reminder, Moses' laws do not say anything about observing the new moon. Nehemiah taught the people the same laws as Ezra did. This was another reminder so the people would not repeat their backsliding patterns. Nehemiah's efforts are the final witness in the Old Testament for observing the covenant worship statutes. It's time for a decision. 
Is it possible these twelve great leaders would not have followed the laws of Moses? Or is it possible there are some things that could have happened with the 1611 King James Version translation to cause such a problem in only 7% of the scriptures establishing the new moon over the new month? There are two possibilities for how the term new moon was inserted into the text rather than new month. The translators ignorantly made a mistake by following and inserting the Jewish traditions of the new moon. Or the translators deliberately erred, causing allegiance and sacred regard to be given to the moon for the month's start. Now we still have a question to be answered. Why are only 7% of the key verses incorrectly translated as moon or moons when the proper translated term would be month or months? The prophet Isaiah in chapter 47.13 talks about the monthly prognosticators. Let's examine that term. Here is Isaiah 47.13 in the King James Version. Thou, Babylon, art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly, age 23.20, prognosticators, age 30.45, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Monthly here, as H2320 is translated correctly. The meaning of monthly H2320 prognosticators H3045 those that ascertain by seeing or every month the astrologers are gazing at the heavenly bodies. Is the King James Version the best translation? Other translations of Isaiah 47.13 say the following. Number one, the English Standard Version. You, Babylon, are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you. Number two, the uh, New American Standard Version. Those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons. Number three, the International Standard Version. Those who conjure the heavens and gaze at the stars, predicting at the new moons. Number four, the Jubilee Bible, 2000. Let now those that contemplate the heavens, those that speculate regarding the stars, those that teach the courses of the moon. Number five, the Darby Bible translation. Let now the interpreters of the heavens, the observers of the stars, who predict according to the new moons. Number six, New World Translation. The lookers at the stars, those giving out knowledge at the new moons. Number seven, revised standard version. Who gaze at the stars? Who at the new moons predict what shall befall you? Number eight, common English Bible. Let the astrologers stand up and save you. Those who gaze at the stars and predict what will happen to you at each new moon. Number nine, the Lexham English Bible. You struggle with your many consultations. Let them stand now and save you. Those who see the stars divide the celestial sphere, who inform by new moons from those things that are coming upon you. Number ten, 
the new century version, those who tell the future by looking at the stars and at the new moons. Let's check out what other Bible commentators have to say about these monthly prognosticators. Here we have Barnes notes about Isaiah 47.13, the thing referred to in the passage before us and which was practiced in Babylon was probably that of forecasting future events or telling what would occur by the observation of the positions of the heavenly bodies. The stargazers, those who endeavor to tell what will occur by the contemplation of the relative positions of the stars. The monthly prognosticators that give knowledge concerning the months, that is, at the commencement of the months, they give knowledge of what events might be expected to occur during the month, perhaps from the dip of the moon or its riding high or low. This whole passage would have been more literally and better translated by preserving the order of the Hebrew. Let them stand up now and save thee, who are astrologers, who gaze upon the stars, and who make known at the new moons what things will come upon thee. Here we have Jameson, Fawcett and Brown. Let the monthly prognosticator save thee from these things that shall come upon thee, those who at each new moon profess to tell thereby what is about to happen. Mora joins, not as the English version, let them that give knowledge concerning the months, margin, save thee from those things that shall come upon thee. But they that at new moons make known part of the things that shall come upon thee, let them also save thee from them. If they can foretell calamities, they ought also to be able to save from them, because both are the work of God. Kiel and Delitzsch, to look with pleasure or with interest at anything, hence Luther has rendered it correctly, die Sterngucke, in English the stargazers. They, Babylon stargazers, are described still further as those who make known with every new moon things which is used in a positive sense out of the great mass of events. They select the most important and prepare a calendar or almanac for the state every month. Summary for Isaiah 47.13 There are many other Bible translations that translate Isaiah 47.13 according to the ways of Babylon, that of star gazers and those that watch for every new moon, a monthly event. Second, there are several other Bible commentaries that also interpret Isaiah 47.13 according to what was really happening in Babylon. Number three, because the translators for the King James Version use the term the monthly prognosticators rather than those who predict by the new moons, did they actually remove important context? from this verse? Yes, the word monthly is H2320, meaning a repetitive occurrence. Number four, this one verse wasn't tampered with at all. Here, H2320 could have been incorrectly translated as new moon as the other 20 verses were. And a mistranslation of the verse would still have been in alignment with the truth of the pagan cultures and their worship practices. Yet this verse was left untouched. 
The question is why? So what's the point? There are 20 key feasts and festival verses in the Old Testament that have been manipulated and tampered with to lead one to believe the feast months really do begin with a new moon. We must recognize this glaring counterfeit. Non-Torah verses must be in alignment with Torah truths. Comparing Psalm 81.3 to Numbers 10.10. Review. Here we have the scripture facts and then the comparison. In 1450 BC, Numbers 10.10 states, In your solemn feast days and in the beginning of your months, age 23.20, ye shall blow with the trumpets. Then in 1030 BC, Psalm 81.3 states, Blow up the trumpet and the new moon, or the new month, age 2320, in the time appointed on your solemn feast day. The book of Numbers dates at least 450 years before Psalm. Numbers is Torah, Psalms is not. King David taught according to Torah. Psalm 81.3 must come into alignment with Numbers 10.10. Moon in Psalm 81 is not H2320. This word should be translated as month. Remember the question, has there been a deliberate attempt by the 1611 translators to save the new moon? Remembering the 1611 King James Version translators, the 1611 King James was completed less than 100 years after Luther. The translators did their best. It's likely they were highly influenced by Jewish traditions, the new moon months being one of them. Remember, the Bible will be accurate with a proper study. In Isaiah 28.10 it states, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. There are no new moons for Yahweh's months. This error has been accepted as a truth, likely because most people just examined 20 verses. Many verses are set in the context of Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts and festivals, and they are all non-Torah verses. As mentioned before, 20 verses represent only 7% of the 283 references that must be searched out. Question: If the translators would have translated H2320 as new month, Instead of new moon, would that have made a difference in understanding the commencement of Yahweh's biblical month today? There should be no question about that. Egyptian and Babylon history of moon worship. Ever wonder about the roots of moon worship? No wonder Yahweh said not to give sacred regard to the moon. Egyptian calendar history. About the 7th century BC, many civilizations discarded the 360-day calendar that was in use for thousands of years. The addition of five extra days to the calendar changed the month's start. Priests were assigned the duty of sighting the new moon for month start, a practice also observed by Babylonians and the Hebrews. Egyptian day and month start. Egyptians began each new day with sunrise. The new months 
began with the disappearance of the old moon just before dawn. Their civil calendar was 360 days with an additional five days grouped together at the end of the year. The lunar calendar followed the moon cycles to regulate religious affairs. The lunar calendar also corresponded with the seasons. Babylonian calendar history 5,000 years ago, Sumerians had a calendar that divided the year into 30-day months or 360 days per year. The month began at the first visibility of the new moon. In time, they found the calendar using the lunisolar cycle of over 19 years with seven intercalations as it used to today. The months were truly lunar. The new moon day began at sunset when the new moon was first visible. Jewish history of moon worship, the first day of the seventh month. Is this picture a familiar sighting? Many watch for the crescent moon to establish the first day of the seventh month as a feast of trumpets. Let's go to the Jewish calendar history. It is not known how the lunar year of 354 days was adjusted to the solar year of 365 days. Why? The scriptures do not mention a 13th month, nor intercalation, a system straight from Babylon. From 587 BC to 70 AD, the Jewish civil year was Babylonian except for a short time under Greece. The commencement of the month was determined by the observation of the crescent new moon. Jewish calendar is lunisolar. By 200 AD, visual observation of the moon was supplanted by secret astronomical calculation. 8th century AD, Karaites follow Muslim practice and return to the actual observation of the crescent moon instead of some secret calculations. Much is also determined according to the Talmud. The lunisolar calendar and its metonic cycle forms the basis for the computation of the date of Easter each year. The Jewish calendar is not scriptural. So who muddled with the divine calendar? Answer, the ones who were to preserve it. We have zero scriptural permission. Now consider this website, quote, from wikibooks.org. It states, there is zero scriptural evidence for citing new moons to determine the beginning of new months. It is based 100% on teachings within the Talmud. The ancient pagan Greeks recognized the visible new moon as the beginning of the month when they celebrated the sickle of the new moon with offerings and meals. This was also the case with the ancient Babylonians who worshipped the new moon as the goddess Isis and had her wearing horns which resembled the new moon. This is from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, volume 4, page 639. The Talmud has no authority over the scriptures. Who is responsible for upholding the moon? When you read all these quotes from the rabbis under the given website, you will notice that starting the month with the sighting of the moon has no scriptural authority.
Quotes for Month's Commencement The new moon began when the thin crescent of the new moon was first visible at sunset. This is from the Theological Wordbook of the Old Testament, Volume 1, page 266. Number 2. The ancient pagan Greeks recognized the visible new moon as the beginning of the month when they celebrated the sickle of the new moon with offerings and meals. This was all the case with the ancient Babylonians who worshipped the new moon as the goddess Isis and had her wearing horns which resembled the new moon. This is from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Volume 4, page 639. Number 3. The ancient Jewish calendar depended not on mathematical calculations and arrangements but was set from month to month according to the physical appearance of the new moon. This is from the Pharisees by Louis Finkelstein, page 601, Jewish Publication Society, 1938, Philadelphia, based on the Talmudic literature. Number 4. In old Israel, the new moon, the day after the crescent, was first sighted in the sky, was celebrated by sacrifices and feasting. This is Judaism by George Foot Moore, Professor of the History of Religion, Harvard, Volume 2, page 22, based on Talmudic literature. Three quotes for month's commencement. Number five, Rosh Kodesh is a Hebrew term meaning the beginning of a month applied to the religious half holiday observed in connection with the appearance of the new moon, that is, the beginning of each new month of the Hebrew calendar. The New Jewish Encyclopedia, page 409, Berman House Publisher, 1976, based on Talmudic literature. Number 6. Philo, the Jewish historian and contemporary of Yeshua, the Messiah, and the Apostles, says that Moses established the moon of the vernal equinox as the uh, first month of the year. The works of Philo on the life of Moses, chapter 61, part 222 and 224. Josephus, the Jewish historian, also confirms this and defines it as when the sun was in Aries. This is also from Josephus. Question, where is the scripture for these claims in the Torah? Four specific quotes from Talmud. Number seven, in the times of the second temple it appears from the Mishnah that the priests had a court to which witnesses came and reported. This function was afterwards taken over by the civil court. C.B. Zuckermann. This is in German here. Materialien zur Entwicklung der altjüdischen Zeitrechnung im Talmud. Breslau from the year of 1882. The fixing of the length of the months and the intercalation of months was the prerogative of the Sanhedrin at whose head there was a patriarch. The entire Sanhedrin was not called upon to act in this matter, the decision being left to a special court of three. The Sanhedrin met on the 29th of each month to await the report of the witnesses. Five Jewish quotes continued. Continuing point number seven. On the evening before the announcement of the intercalation, the Patriarch assembled certain scholars who assisted in the decision. It was then announced to the various Jewish communities by letters. To this epistle was added the reason for the intercalation. A copy of such letter of Rabban Gamaliel is preserved in the Talmud. In the Mishnah, the book containing the late 2nd century record of Jewish legal rulings and other religious records, we find recorded that the Jews' religious leaders established rigorous protocols and rituals for determining when the new moon had been sighted. 
question again. Where is the scripture for these claims in the Torah? Six quotes regarding Joseph and Psalm 81.3. Number eight, Psalm 81 tells that Joseph instituted the Rosh Kodesh during his tenure as the Viceroy of Egypt. Joseph had the power to declare the decree and the people of Egypt, principally the sons of Israel, were delighted to make the recognition of the new moon as a joyful feast. The testimony was to honor Joseph for what he did as a righteous deliverer, who in many ways prefigured the coming Messiah of Israel and the redemption that he would ultimately bring. All of Yahweh's feasts are a role play of eternal truth in his eternal purposes and keep his redemptive plan before us. What Joseph set in place as a testimony has been established as a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. Psalm 81, 3 to 4. The works of Philo on the life of Moses, chapter 61, part 222 and 224. Josephus, the Jewish historian, also confirms this and defines it as when the sun was in Arius, Josephus. Note again, Psalm 81.3 has no basis from Torah to blow the trumpet on the new moon. Seven quotes regarding Moses and Numbers 10.10. .10. Number nine, in Numbers 10.10 it is recorded that the trumpet is to be blown to sanctify the new moon as a feast day. At the beginning of your month you shall offer a burnt offering to Yahweh. This is a burnt offering of each month throughout the month of the year. It shall be offered besides the continual burnt offerings and its drink offerings. That's Numbers 28.11-15. to 15. Moses called the people to assembly on the new moon and spoke to them according to the commandment he had been given by Yahweh, exhorting them to faith and obedience. Really? Note again, number 1010 records new month, not new moon. 8. Misquotes stated as truth. Nehemiah. Number 10. In the restoration of the law under Nehemiah, the new moons were reinstituted and kept from that time through to the destruction of the temple in 70 of the Common Era. Josephus records that they were kept during the entire temple period and the high priest attended in the temple on the new moons and Sabbaths. Nehemiah? Really? 9. Misquotes stated as truth, Solomon. 11. Moses commanded the keeping of the new moons. In Second Chronicles 8, 12 to 13, Solomon said that it, as well as the other feasts, were an ordinance forever to Israel. Second Chronicles 2, 3 to 4. Number 12. As sincere followers of Yahweh's word, we should be observing them, meaning the new moons, now, and preparing ourselves as his bride, fully adorned in all righteousness. The bride observing new moons? Really? Let's remember the following. Just because the rabbis can be quoted, and just because the Talmud has written instruction on the rules following the crescent moon, this is hardly a reason to accept the new moons at the beginning of the month. Torah has priority. Moon comments from Bible dictionaries. Will any of these commentaries agree with scripture? Or will they support the Talmud and the moon month teachings? All of the commentaries recognize the fact that Yahweh's people were easily influenced by the pagans that worshipped the moon. Take careful note 
of this history. Number one, New Unger's Bible Dictionary says the following. The worship of the moon was extensively practiced by the nations of the East. Ur in Lower Mesopotamia, Abraham's birthplace, was an important center of the worship of Sin, the moon god, as was Haran in Upper Mesopotamia, where Abraham and Terah immigrated. In Egypt, the moon was honored under the name Isis and was one of the only two deities that commanded the reference of all the Egyptians. In Syria, the moon was represented by one of the Ashtaroth surnamed Karnaim, from the horns of the crescent moon by which she was distinguished. There are indications of the early introduction into the countries adjacent to Palestine of a species of worship distinct from any that we have described, namely the direct homage of the heavenly bodies, sun, moon, and stars, characteristic of Sabianism. The first notice we have of this is in Job 31, 26 to 28. It says, If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart has been secretly enticed to worship them, or my mouth has kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge. For I should, or would, have denied the God that is above. New Angus Bible Dictionary 1b And it is observable that one warning of Moses, as found in Deuteronomy 4.19, is directed against this nature worship rather than against the form of moon worship that the Israelites must have witnessed in Egypt. At a later period, however, the worship of the moon in its grosser form of idol worship was introduced from Syria. In 2 Kings 23.5 we read that Josiah did away with those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon. Except for a brief period under Josiah, Manasseh appears to have been the great patron of this form of idolatry, for he worshipped all the hosts of heaven. Chapter 21, 3 and 5 From his reign down to the captivity, moon worship continued to prevail among the Jews. Date about 624 BC, 20 years before the sundial miracle. Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. The moon had a special significance for the ancient Israelites. Their festival calendar, which began each month with the rising of the new moon, was known as a lunar calendar. The accurate recording of the new moon as it arrived each month was important because the moon governed the dates for other religious festivals. The prophet Amos condemned Israel's merchants for their impatience with the interruption to business caused by the festival of the new moon as seen in Amos 8 4 to 6. Date about 787 BC. Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 113 to 15, God condemned the formal but empty observance of the new moon festival. Date about 760 BC. Three, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. The moon was very early worshipped by the nations of the Far East as the divinity or the representative of one or more deities. This personification and worship of the moon among the nations who were neighbors to Palestine was but part of an elaborate nature 
worship found among these people. Nor was this worship always separated from Palestine by geographical lines. It crept into the thought and customs of the Hebrews and in a sense affected their religious conceptions and ceremonies. They fell into the habit of making direct homage to sun, moon and stars. The actual worship of the moon and the idolatry consequent thereon seem to have touched the Hebrews, though this is disputed by some. It would seem difficult to explain Second Kings 21.3 in 698 BC upon any other supposition, and in Second Kings 23.4-5 about 624 BC we have a clear statement that Josiah put down the worship of the moon among the people and silenced the priests of this form of worship. Four, Father's Bible Dictionary, Moon. Instead of the moon being regarded as a person and worshipped, as it was by the surrounding nations, in Scripture it is God's creature made for prophetic signs, agricultural seasons, days and years. See Psalm 104, 19. The brightness of the moon in the east guiding the travelers by night, when the heat of day is past, gives it a prominence which it has not with us. Psalm 8, 3. In Psalm 89, 37, however, the moon is not the faithful witness, but God is witness to his own oath. Translated, and the witness of God in heaven is faithful. So Psalm eighty nine thirty five, meaning Yahweh has sworn his truth by his holiness. It, meaning the moon, influences vegetable growth. Deuteronomy thirty three fourteen, moons, namely its phases. Others explain months at the times of ripening fruits. Note these are ordinances of the moon. The moon was worshipped as Isis in Egypt, as Kanaim in Syria, as Sin, Lord of the Month, in Babylon. Fawcett's Bible Dictionary continued, 4b, The moon was worshipped as Isis in Egypt, as Kanaim, two horns of Ashtaroth, wife of Baal, the king of heaven, the male and female symbolizing the generative powers of nature, in Syria as sin, lord of the month, in Babylon, Zabaism, from Zaba, the heavenly hosts, was the earliest of false worships. It appears in our pagan names sun, day, moon, day. The quote continues with Job 31.26, and the problem of adoration of the moon. Josiah put down those who burned incense to the moon. See Second Kings 23.5 and that was around 624 BC. She was called Queen of Heaven, Jeremiah 7.18, though that may mean Venus, Urania, cakes, round like her moon, discs were offered to her. So far from the moon being an object of worship, it, the moon, unconsciously worships its maker. Psalm 148, 3 and 8, 3. This is from the BibleHistory.com. Have you heard this? The moon will not withdraw itself? What does Isaiah 60, 20 mean? that the moon will not withdraw itself? Will there be a time that the moon as we see it today will eventually never withdraw itself? Or is there another concept? We will consider two options. Review of uh, Isaiah 60.20, a prophetic reference to H3391 or the lunation cycle and phases of the moon. Isaiah 60.20 It's a prophetic reference of H3391, the moon. 
It states, Thy moon shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. That is age 3391, lunation cycle. For Yahweh shall be thine everlasting light. Context. Yahweh's people are in his glory. Could the phrase, the moon will no longer withdraw itself, mean no longer changing the H3391 phases? If there is no withdrawing process, there will be no changing phases of the moon. This would make it very difficult to observe any worship statutes with Yahweh from new moon to new moon, like it says in Isaiah 66.23. Therefore, any understanding of a new moon in this context would be an impossibility. Isaiah 66.23 Worship in the Holy City And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Yahweh. Did not Isaiah 60.20 just inform us that the, new, that the moon will no longer withdraw itself, indicating the strong possibility of completely eliminating the faces of the moon forever? How can Isaiah first tell us that the moon will no longer go through the faces, creating the renewing of the moon, and then just a few chapters later tell us that we will be worshipping according to the new moon? Is there a problem here somewhere? All the problems are eliminated when we realize we are not to be following any face of the moon in the first place. This all the means the moon should not receive any sacred regard. Review. Jeremiah tells us about consequences for turning away from Torah commands. Here is Jeremiah 8, 2. And shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of the heavens, which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked, which they have sought and to which they have bowed themselves. They shall not be gathered nor buried, they shall be for dung on the face of the earth. That's taken from the scripture translation. Remember Isaiah 1, 4-5 and 10-17 documents the traditions that insidiously infiltrated and contaminated the worship services of the Hebrew nation. Paying allegiance to the moon as a marker for feasts and festivals is a top alarm on the list. Many other prophets sounded the same message. Questions to ask and thoughts to ponder. We have traveled through a lot of material. Where do we go from here? Concluding the Moon Month study, there are still some unanswered questions for the study, and let's ponder over some of them. Day 1 of Creation Is the first day of creation and the first month Abib of the sacred year, or the seventh month Tishri of the civil year? Would that information affect the following questions? Number two, is the first day of creation also the first day of the month, of the first year of this earth? This is not a trick question. Number three, remember the lights are brought forth on day four of creation week. The moon, then and now. This is a review. Number four. Today our moon has no light of its own, only reflected light from the sun. In fact, the moon never did have its own light because of this verse. Jeremiah 31, 35 So says Jehovah, 
who gives the sun for a light by day, the laws of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Jehovah of hosts is his name. This is the literal translation of the Holy Bible. Let's rearrange Jeremiah 31:35. So says Jehovah, who gives the sun for a light by day and the stars for a light by night. The laws, the ordinances of the moon, H3394, Yareach, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. When the verse is organized this way, it makes sense and aligns with Genesis 1:16 perfectly because the stars have nothing to do with tides of the sea. It is the moon that stabilizes the tidal activity. Although the verse is very clear about the two lights given to the earth, the sun being the greater light giver by day, the stars being the lesser light givers by night. Nothing can be found about the moon being a light giver at all. Many ifs to consider. Number one, the lights are not found in the firmament until day four of creation. Then, was the moon's face at conjunction, at crescent, or full moon? In Genesis 1, 14 to 18. Number two, those that believe the months were supposed to start with the moon, would that have been on the first day of creation? or the fourth day of creation. Many ifs to consider. Number three, if the moon starts the first month on the fourth day of creation, what happens to days number one, two and three of creation? Are they now dead days? Everyone should know which day of creation is actually the first day of the first month. Is the following thought logical? In the first week of creation, the moon began the first month on the fourth day. How could that be a Torah teaching? Can creation solve the problem? The moon month issue seems to have a huge problem with the creation account. If the moon is to begin the months today, then doesn't the moon have to follow some kind of a pattern from the creation week in order to begin the creation months? Do you think Yahweh's restoration of the lights in the sky on day four was deliberate? Why not day three? Again, pay attention to the meaning of Psalm 104 verse 30. Is it even possible for day four to be the beginning of the first month? If not, then does that mean the moon can never begin Yahweh's months? What about other arguments? Many say the moon was in conjunction for days one, two and three. Then the crescent appeared on day four of creation. How could that happen? when there were no visible lights in the firmament until day number four. Is it possible that a conjunction would last three full days on the first week of a perfect creation? Did the moon even have any faces? And number four, how many people can give confirmation about how the month begins by using Genesis 1? Do they know there are two types of months? Or do most of them default to Exodus 12, the 14th day of the first month? It's the same old argument. Most say Exodus 12 supports the 14th day as having a full moon in the month of Abib. Though the first day must be the new moon. How? Where is the scriptural proof for this? This is 2,500 
50 years after creation. What about this thought? Maybe there is no need to find answers because the moon has nothing to do with ushering in the months anyway. Full moon on the 14th day of the month? Where in the scriptures is there even one witness that the 14th day of the first month must be attended with a full moon? How are these conclusions found in Torah? Is it possible that what most feast keepers have been taught about the moon is nothing but a strong traditional belief handed down from the rabbis? Full moon on the 14th day of the month. At the cross, the sun blacked out from noon to the ninth hour on what is considered the very darkest day of the universe. How do we reason that the night sky of Yahweh's Passover had a bright full moon? If the Passover of Exodus 12 had a bright full moon, then why did the people need the pillar of fire by night to guide their steps when they left Egypt? There is a lot of light when traveling at night under the light of a full moon. Could it be the Exodus 12 Passover night really was a very dark night? Because the moon was not full, or it was in full conjunction? Is it time to leave doubt behind? There are many people searching for Yahweh's covenant calendar. The complete moon month study shows beyond the shadow of any doubt that the moon is not involved with the calculation or the month's commencement of Yahweh's annual feasts and festivals. The moon month is connected to the agricultural ordinances to bless this earth and mankind, a very important mandate for us. Satan will use every possible method to place our sacred regard for the moon where it does not belong. Is the moon really in charge of the biblical month? A short review. Moon worship or sacred regard for the moon along with sun worship has had a huge impact on Yahweh's people all through the ages including many feast calendars today. Here's a short review of what has been brought forth so far. Number one in the garden. The fallen Lucifer was given sacred regard in the garden from the old word Luke. The name Lucifer connects to the moon through the words lunar and lunation. The moon is linked to worship of the moon goddess, especially in the Asherah garden growths and high places. Today, sacred regard is still being given to the moon through the moon month commencement on the feast calendars. Number two, Adam to Noah. The patriarchs remained free from worship of other gods. Number three, after the flood, Nimrod became the sun god. Semiramis became the moon goddess. Number four, Terah, Abraham, called out of Ur of the Galdees, an area of pagan sun god and moon goddess worship. Number five, Haran. Terra resides here, a center dedicated to moon goddess worship. Number six, Terra, Laban. Both were attached to their teraphim, their moon images, very likely a family business. Number seven, Abraham. Yah's patriarch called out from moon worship to reside in Canaan. Number eight, Shechem, oak tree. Jacob buries the family idols that Rachel stole from her father. These teraphim images linked to Terah. Nine, Egypt. 
great multitude of pagan Egyptians and their gods leave with Moses. Number 10. Mount Sinai. Sacred regard given to the pagan gods, including the moon goddess, through the altar and golden calf in this moon worshipping area, the wilderness of sin. Before Moses died, he gave strict instructions in Deuteronomy 4 and 17 to not look to and worship the gods of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Number 11. Jericho. Yahshua was commanded to destroy this moon worshipping city before settling in Canaan. Number 11. Again, Shechem commitment. Yahshua encouraged the people to put away their family idols of sun and moon gods. Number 12. Old Testament history. Ashtaroth, moon goddess worship, was a huge problem in the groves and high places for both Israel and Judah. Number 13. Hezekiah. Sun dial miracle had a direct effect on moving the moon out of its 30-day orbit as Yahweh tried to move his people away from the pagan waves of moon goddess worship. Number 14. Return from Babylon. Judah's exiles incorporated the Babylonian sun and moon components into Yahweh's calendar. For most, sunset begins the day, the crescent moon commences the month. Number 15. Today. The majority of feast calendars all honor the sunset for day start, but even more serious, they honor a variety of moon sightings for month start. The moon component in these feast calendars gives honor to Lucifer's moon goddess. Nothing is documented in scripture. It's time to expose the moon. Is it a lunar deception? A uh, lunatic authority? Or both? Review from previous slides. Old Testament entries for number one, sun god worship, Baal, Baalim, 87 times. Number two, Moon Goddess Worship, Ashtaroth, Queen of Heaven, High Places and Growth, 129 times. Does it look like the Moon Goddess has authority? Walk in the Light Ephesians chapter 5, the verses 8 and 11 say the following. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in Yahweh. Walk as children of light. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Let it go. Deuteronomy 4.23 Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of Yahweh your Elohim. With this study it is hoped many will grasp the fact that Yahweh's elegant calendar not only follows biblical patterns and is part of his covenant, it's simple, orderly and easy to understand. You don't have to worry about the moon anymore. Blessings to everyone on your studies. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shalom.